everybody and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. This week, part two of the plight of the broiler producer. U.S. Farm Report crew members were in Cullman, Alabama to record this story. Cullman, Alabama ranks number four in all the nation in broiler production. The state of Alabama is third in broiler production behind only the states of Arkansas and Georgia. From the standpoint of agricultural income, the county of Cullman in Alabama ranks in the top 100 agricultural counties in all the nation. My first guest on U.S. Farm Report was Mr. Kyle Smith, a broiler producer and dairyman from the Cullman area. Kyle, uh, 12 years ago, at two and a half cents, were you making a living in the broiler business? Oh, yes, you was making some money then, yes. Uh, you could pay your expenses, laboring, light bills, and uh, your heating bills, your repairs, and you could come out. What we thought we could come out, we wasn't figuring depreciation on buildings and equipment. Yeah. Well, now, you fellas have the feeling, do you not, that if your price should increase to three cents, that this would turn it, that this would allow you to make a living once again. We think that it would put us back about where we was 12 years ago. Well, in other words, what I'm trying to do, and I certainly don't mean to imply that I'm an economist, and I know that you're not either, but I'm guessing, and maybe you'll guess with me, that two and a half cents in uh, 1958 would buy, uh, well, let me put it this way, uh, three cents today will probably buy about what two and a half cents would buy in 1950. That's about right, yes. Bill. Kyle, we have seen uh, three of your broiler houses on film. Now, you have altogether six. Right. We have mentioned uh, what you're doing with a couple. Uh, you're putting calves in one. You have some horse stalls in another. Now, when you had all six of these broiler houses uh, going at the full blast, uh, what was your capacity for one grow out? Six to seven thousand. Did that figure out about what one bird per square foot? That figured out about one per nine ten square foot. That's pretty close to to a square yeah, foot. Right. Isn't it? Now, how many uh, grow outs does the broiler producer have in a season? About four. About four. Just about four. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the routine uh, of uh, your doing business with the contractor. Uh, what does he bring you? He brings us feed and broilers and uh, medication. And then he expects you in return to do what? Uh, heat, furnish labor, and grow them out. Now, have you kept any time cost accounting records on just exactly the time that you've invested in this broiler business and how much money you get for your time and labor? You don't get any money for your labor and time. It just don't figure it. Now, you mentioned heat. Uh, you have a year-round job in the broiler business when it's going full, and uh, you have certainly to heat these broiler houses. Is the, is the heat factor an expensive one? It's very expensive. What does it cost, for example, for one grow out in six broiler houses to heat them? In the dead winter time, it'll cost uh, three quarters to a cent a pound to furnish the heat. Yeah. And in addition to that, you have heated with coal, and that represents a lot of hand labor, right, doesn't it? Right, right. Let's go back to this uh, two cent price that you fellows are getting today for these broilers. And uh, let's take that broiler from the time it leaves you and goes back to the producer 
uh, and gets to uh, the supermarket and to the consumer and talk about price. Uh, you get uh, two cents, and the broiler weighs approximately how much after six or eight weeks? About three and a half pounds. And it is after six to eight weeks that the contractor comes and picks them up, That's right? right. So three and a half pounds means that you're getting six and a half cents, perhaps, on the average per bird. About that. That's about, that's close. What do you suppose the contractor receives for that same bird net after he pays for the feed and after he pays for the processing? I think that he'll make a dime a bird after he pays for all of it. I think the processor makes more net than we make in all. All right, now, when that same three and a half pound broiler gets to the supermarket and my wife or your wife goes in there to buy it, what is she paying for it today? She'll pay about a dollar and 15 cents for a broiler. In addition to a little break in price, you fellas are also interested in some fringe benefits. Would you tell me about that? Yes, we think they should uh, help us on the condemn, on the heat, and on the litter. Uh, here are production costs for you fellows that are rising day by day. I presume litter costs considerably more than it did last year and will cost more next year than it does today. Bill, litter costs twice, two times as much as it did 12 years ago to, yeah. to get one house ready for shavings. So you'd like for the contractor to, to provide you with the litter. You'd like for him to provide you with heat. Right. With uh, the utilities. That's right. And uh, you mentioned condemnation. This is quite a factor in this business, isn't it? Government very, inspectors very. Uh, have a hand in it. Would you explain to our viewers how this works? Uh, they take these brawlers to these plants and they run them. And uh, the condemn, we lose all of that. They sell the condemn. We get nothing out of the condemn. Well, now, in case we have listening today and watching, uh, Kyle, uh, some urban dwellers who don't understand this business, would you explain what a condemned bird is in terms of the broiler business? A condemned bird is a bird that they say is not fit to sell. Not fit for human consumption. That's right. right. Mm -hmm. Now, they, they condemn the bird, and what happens to that bird? They take it and put it in the tankage and, uh, and reuse it. How is feed. it reused, Kyle? In feed. In other words, there's a good possibility that out of your broiler house might come some condemned birds that might return to your broiler house by the contractor in the form of feed Possible. for your broilers. Right. That's always a possibility, isn't right. it? Right. Well, I think that you've pretty well outlined the problem and why the broiler industry is in the shape it's in. What do you think the broiler man can do to solve this problem, Kyle? I think we've got to have more money. How do you suggest that uh, that you fellas go about getting that done? I think we should go through NFO and get it done. Now, going through NFO and getting it done, as you say, I think perhaps can be boiled down to something rather simple, and that is that you could hold square footage, couldn't you? Right. I think we could hold it, and when they start paying us enough to be a, have a profit out of it, we can grow them the broilers. Then you can give them back the square footage right. again to grow their broilers. Right. Them. Yeah. Well, Kyle, although things have been bad for you, as well as the other broiler producers in uh, this county, uh, you do have something on the bright side in your farming operation, and that's the fact that you run a dairy. Tell us about it. Well, Bill, it's, it's not on the bright side by... Far. It's just a little brighter than the broiler yeah. business. <laughs> By comparison, right. anything might yeah. be bright, huh? Right. Uh, we are doing a little better in the dairy business than we are the broiler business. How many uh, How many cows are you milking? Uh, about 225. And is yours a grade A operation? Grade A. Yeah. What uh, What are they, Holstein cows? Uh, they are mostly Holsteins. Yeah. What about your replacement program? Uh, you have a good calf program going? Bill, we raise all of our heifers out of our better cows. I see. And uh, that has uh, made our dairy a little better by being able to improve. Yeah. What kind of a milking parlor do you have? Do you have the pit type? Uh, I have a straight walk-through uh, parlor type. Uh -huh. How many cows does it accommodate at one time? Ten cows comes through at a time. You know, we always like to talk to our NFO members about investment. Uh, I think that 
many people don't realize the dollars that can be invested in farming operations that are invested in them. Now, to get back to um, a subject you're not too happy about, the broiler business, you've had no small investment in these broiler houses and the equipment. How much do you figure you had invested in it? Oh, I've got around twenty-five to 30000 invested in the broiler business. And what about your dairy operation? What kind of an investment do you figure you have there, Kyle? Oh, uh, I have a much greater investment in my dairy operation. Do you cow have any wise. idea what it amounts to dollar-wise? It'll run around $1,500 per cow. Per cow. That's right. for the whole... Uh, uh, that's for the whole operation. Right. In other words, we're talking now about your buildings, your equipment, the land, and everything. Cattle, that's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, Kyle, thank you so much. It's been great seeing you. And, uh, you know, this is my first trip to Alabama, and I want you to know I'm enjoying it. Thank you, Bill. In spite of the fact that Cullman County, Alabama, is among the top agricultural counties in all the nation, the farms there are comparatively small, very small indeed. They average some 45 to 50 to 55 acres each. By comparison, our next guest on U.S. Farm Report, E.T. White, is a farmer with a large operation. E.T. farms some 450 acres in the Cullman area. Now, let me ask you this, E.T. Uh, when you had all three of your broiler houses uh, up and operating, how much of an investment did you have in the broiler business? Well, I had insurance on the three projects for the total amount of $25,000, which uh, in my judgment was considerably less than the real value of them. The replacement value, I should think, would be the way to figure, wouldn't you? That would be my thinking. If I endeavored to uh, continue in this operation, of course, I'd have to invest around $15,000 to replace this house that burned, and by those standards, I could reasonably assume that I had around $45,000 invested in the three projects. And in replacing the one that burned for $15,000, you would be almost doubling the money uh, that uh, was paid to you by the insurance company for this loss, right? Just about. Yeah. yeah about twice, yes. Yeah. What sort of efforts, uh, E.T., has the Farm Bureau made through this area to uh, try to bring about a turn upward in this uh, broiler problem? Well, in my judgment, Farm Bureau made a, they made a effort all right. And I, I'm sincere when I say that I think they made a sincere effort. But in my judgment, their approach was not the approach that will bring any good results mm -hmm. in that it's too far removed from the farmers themselves. Mm -hmm. now, their program might work in some other fields of uh, agriculture, but uh, the broiler industry is too far from the lawmakers in Washington or Montgomery or any of these uh, lawmaking bodies. They're not familiar enough with the uh, problems of broiler growing to, mm -hmm. to come to our rescue. And how long ago was it, E.T., that you were attracted to and joined NFO? I joined NFO in December of 19 and... 68. 68. Yes, sir. What has been the trend among your fellow Farm Bureau members through this area? Are they, too, joining NFO in addition to maintaining their membership in Farm Bureau? In December 1968, I was a member of Farm Bureau and had gone uh, to uh, Farm Bureau broiler market meetings, which I was a county representative at that time for Farm Bureau marker, uh, broiler market service. And at that time, I was growing some hogs for market. And I hauled my hogs, at that time, I hauled hogs to uh, Tupelo, Mississippi, which is about 125 to 130 miles one way from my farm. And by hauling hogs to Tupelo, Mississippi, by making sometimes three long-distance telephone calls to their buyer at the uh, Mid-South Packing Plant in Tupelo, Mississippi, and picking the high-trend days on the market, I could get as, sometimes as much as 18 cents per pound for hogs. Mm -hmm. And uh, along about that time, the same December month that I joined NFO, I carried hogs to Tupelo twice that month. 
And uh, these people, NFO uh, representatives, told me that there was a possibility that we could get a NFO collection point in Alabama if we would support it. I told them it sounded like a real good program to me and that I was for it. And I joined the NFO, and to my pleasure, in a few months, the NFO did make an effort and did establish a pickup point at Albertville, Alabama on Sand Mountain, about 50 miles from my home. E.T., you're a good, loyal Farm Bureau member, have been, as you've said, for many years. Do you see any conflict in the world, any reason in the world, why a Farm Bureau member can't, recognizing the capabilities of NFO, go ahead and join NFO, retain his Farm Bureau membership, the insurance, and all of those benefits? Well, I've discussed this with some of my co-workers in Farm Bureau and some of the uh, staff. Mm -hmm. And I made the remark to one of my good friends who is a staff member to Farm Bureau, and I put it to him this way when he rather rebuked me for being an NFO member some months ago, and I said, well, I'd rather have two friends any time than one. Good point. Yes, Excellent sir. point. Right. And I, I, I have no qualms with Farm Bureau if they, I have paid my broiler dues, and if they have something that they think is uh, will be a, an effective thing and can show me some results, I'll go along with any sure. program they can offer that can can uh, better our situation. That's all I'm really looking for. Certainly. I think that's all any farmer's looking yes, for. Yes, sir. That's true. Uh, what do you think of the space holding action we're in right now for the broiler industry? Do you feel that this is the way to do it? Well... Apparently, this is the only way. There have been different approaches, and we've made uh, numerous attempts to reckon with these people and uh, try to point out to them our need for some consideration in this price squeeze thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have failed to recognize or have failed to respond. I don't know which the program or which the... Uh, real issue is in their regard whether they have failed to recognize it or whether they have failed to respond. I am I am led to believe that they have failed to respond. I'm sure they are well aware. And uh, while that the broiler that are dressed in this county, and there's lots of them, while the, the market ready-to-cook demand has steadily increased and uh, ready-to-cook prices have steadily increased. Our, uh, our uh, price for producing these chickens has remained at a minimum. Yes, yes. Indeed. And hasn't mm -hmm. increased any to speak of. We haven't, we haven't made any gains at all. Matter of fact, when you analyze this thing and see the high condemnation that they place against our birds, when we get a final settlement, we have gone backward, actually backward. You've lost money. Yes, sir. We, we, we realize less net return mm -hmm. on a given thousand of birds now than we did two or three or five years ago when I, five years ago is when I first involved myself in this thing. And at that time, I've had less than 1% condemnation. In 1969, I had as high as 15% condemnation. And I can't see that there's any, any fault of my own because my practice was essentially the same. And I feel like that uh, if the condemnation is going to be placed on me, I should have some prerogative about uh, what flock I am mm -hmm. placed with. I have no choice about what flock I receive in my houses or uh, what the background is of the disease problems with those yes. breeder flocks. Yes. And, <clears throat> and But I am expected to suffer all the condemnation. Well, if you'd get, say, a cent more per pound, that would bring you to three cents a pound. If you were to get some of the fringe benefits that are being discussed around this area, it might turn the business to the profit side, mightn't it? It's a must. We must realize some profit out of this thing if we're to continue. Yes. The most of the people that I talk to that are in the broiler business and have been in the broiler business considered imperative that they do begin to realize some return on their investment and at least a fair uh, wage for their endeavor. 
Let me ask you to uh, tell our viewers the story you told me earlier today about a neighbor of yours who owned a few acres of land, what he did with it, and then what he in turn did with the money. I think that this better tells the broiler situation story in this area than any story I've heard. Well, it's a, it's a very familiar story in my community here. A lot of my neighbors could relate it to you, probably as well or better than I can. But this neighbor had about 200 acres of what we considered good productive farmland. And of course the broiler industry, this has been some 20 years ago. And uh, maybe not quite that long, maybe we'd say in a range of 15 years. But anyway, he, uh, the broiler industry had begun to expand in that given time in this area. And a lot of new integrators had moved in and one or two uh, individuals had uh, involved themselves in broiler production. This man decided that with labor shortage began to appear on the local scene that he would be better equipped to uh, sell his farm and buy a small track and go in the broiler production. He did. To my understanding, he sold this 200-acre farm for around $18,000. A lot of us thought that that was a fair price for it and wondered how that one could uh, get $18,000 for, for the farm. Incidentally, he sold this farm to a lawyer in Atlanta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, I couldn't conceive why a man in profession would go and involve himself with uh, a farm. But as time passed, and this man took the $18,000 and bought a small track of land, built one broiler house. And he related to me as how that he, when he first started in the broiler production, that he got as high as $150 per thousand birds produced for a local integrator. And he felt at first that he had made a right decision, that he was on the right track. But after he had produced for a few months or a few short years, he found his uh, price for producing broilers began to decline down to $120 a thousand, down to $100 a thousand. And he decided that, that this had uh, marred his income to the point where that he must do something else. Mm -hmm. So he went and built another broiler house, decided to get a little bigger and maybe have a little more production and volume and get along. So he did. He built another house and wasn't long until he was down to $80 a thousand. And down to, he told me he'd got as little as 60 and $55 per thousand on those two houses. And he finally built the third broiler house. Attempting to get efficiency. Attempting and to bigger. get bigger and more efficient would seem to be his uh, reasonable approach. Well, this man is retirement age now and has used up his energies of trying to uh, recover from this thing that he involved himself in. And incidentally, this, uh, this lawyer that bought this property for $18,000 never did any improvement to it. Matter of fact, the farmer went the other way. The fences went down and the buildings depreciated, no repairs made. 1969, this lawyer now in uh, Atlanta sold this same farm to the state of Alabama for for development and a state park for $100,000, to my understanding. How are you making a living in farming here on your acreage right now? Well, of course, we have to revise our plans as uh, new scenes arise. Of course, uh, we have cattle on some of the acreage that we have here to four row cropped in cotton and potatoes. And of course we have forest land. And uh, oftentimes we find it necessary to go to the woods and, and uh, harvest timber. And of course uh, we do sell some of the production of the cattle. And we have, since the NFO has moved into this area and has offered, apparently uh, offered a substantial increase in the market of pork and beef, we have been able to take up the slack with those by expanding some in that area. Mm -hmm. 
Now, I haven't talked with you about your family. How many uh, kids do you have? Well, we have five children. We have three sons and two daughters. I have uh, two sons in college and one that uh, finishes high school this uh, school year end, mm -hmm. which will be in uh, June. Mm -hmm. What kind of hopes do you have for these uh, young people, particularly your sons? I would guess, now that I know you and now that I know that this is the fourth generation of the White family on this particular farm, that uh, you would hope that there would be a future for these boys uh, in farming. Well, of course, yes, this has been my life's dream that uh, there would be some way for these boys to uh, involve themselves in farming. The two that are in college now expect to major in agriculture studies at uh, Auburn University. And uh, like I say, I, this has been my dream in rearing these sons here on this farm. They know it, know the general operation of it, and they don't mind the work. They uh, understand what it takes to make a farm uh, produce. And the only problem we have is uh, getting a fair market for the goods we produce. That's All you're asking is a price at the marketplace that is fair. That they can uh, uh, feel like that they've got a, a fair uh, piece of the action that I think they deserve. They, uh, they don't want something for nothing. We never have had and we don't expect to start getting something for nothing now. All we want is a is a chance to sell our products for a reasonable price like uh, uh, the people that work at our plants and local employment the places that have uh, less than the standard average in the United States even that. But it, there's uh, under the present conditions I, I can't really see any uh, bright future for them unless we can uh, develop some program that will show them some incentive for for their efforts. Do you feel, uh, E.T., that the NFO is uh, making efforts in the area of getting for the farmer that fair price for his product at the marketplace? Apparently they're uh, they're working in the right direction. We all know that uh, food is the, is the basis for all of our society. And we also know that somebody must continue to do this thing. I hope you've enjoyed U.S. Farm Report's coverage of the plight of the broiler producer these past two weeks, our coverage emanating in the Cullman, Alabama area. U.S. Farm Report is seen on this station each week at this same time. Until next week, so long, everybody. Mm -hmm.